I interact with a hell of a lot of people who are very powerful, very successful, and very rich. And I have never seen such concentrated mediocrity in my life. There is a centuries-long program of affirmative action that elevates mediocre, boring people to positions of incredible wealth and power. If Bitcoin isn't about changing that structure and creating opportunity for all of those people who didn't have that, then what the fuck are we doing? Hi audience, welcome to a very special episode. We have a very special guest for you today. This is the, the voice of Bitcoin himself, Mr. Andreas Antonopoulos. Oh, hello. Thank um, you. <laughs> glad you could make it. <laughs> yeah, thank you for coming today. Like I just said. Oh, it's, it's, a, it's a real pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, so we're here at the LeBitConf, Latin American Bitcoin Conference in Montevideo, Uruguay. The very, very beautiful, very beautiful town. I've been really enjoying myself. We have uh, about half an hour to, to have a little discussion, so let's kick it off. <laughs> All right, awesome. So today we're going to be going mostly into Bitcoin culture and Bitcoin futurism. Okay. First, first question, there's an often cited figure that the current market cap of gold is around $8 trillion. And this means if you calculate based on the pricing, if Bitcoin were to take on the market cap of gold, we'd be looking at a price per Bitcoin of somewhere on the order of $420,000, uh -huh. which means that basically everyone who has substantial Bitcoin now would become extremely rich. Uh -huh. And it seems to me like the majority of people who have Bitcoin now are early adopters, Bitcoin holders, and Chinese investors seem to make up the bulk of it. And the way I see it, since 85% of Bitcoins have already been mined, that will ever be created, if Bitcoin succeeds, these people are going to become the new global financial elite, mm -hmm. the most influential people in the world. Yeah. So could you speak a little bit to Bitcoin culture, what the people are like? who hold Bitcoin and how you think they would influence society if they became the most financially influential people in the world? I mean, that's, uh, yeah, what a scary idea. <laughs> um, I think there's a, there is a fairly strong attitude among many people who get involved in this space that we're quite happy with the architecture of power having its nice pyramid shape. Mm -hmm. And the amount of shaking up we want to do in the world financial system is to just replace the faces at the top with ours. Okay. And, and that attitude is absolutely toxic and misses the point of, of what these things are. So, first of all, I don't buy some of the assumptions that uh, the Bitcoin will reach the, the market capitalization of gold, for example. I don't think that's the case. Um, I think it's an extremely unlikely uh, scenario. Ever? I, I, I can't make predictions that are absolute like that, but I, I think it's, it's much more likely that we're going to see many different evolutions in finance now that the door has opened mm. to creating truly open decentralized systems. Now, Bitcoin may end up being a reserve currency to many other systems. It may end up increasing in value. I don't know. I don't particularly care. What I care about, my definition of success for Bitcoin and for any open public cryptocurrency is the degree of freedom it affords to as many people as possible. A, a very straightforward utilitarian mills attitude towards, towards success, right? Now, okay, so let's play the scenario as if the assumption is true. And Bitcoin does indeed do that. Right. First of all, from the people I know who hold Bitcoin, um, the vast majority of people who became early adopters, due to the reason and the way that they became early adopters, have continued to trade, invest, reinvest, and spend that Bitcoin. Uh, it's actually very difficult to hold, especially over the long term. People who are investment-minded get bored. Withholding, so they invest. Uh, greedy people are unsatisfied with simply holding, so they invest. Entrepreneurial people actually enjoy the entrepreneurial part, not the profits, so they invest. Mm -hmm. Panicked people, because the market just turned down, they sell. There's, I think, 
uh, uh, if you started seeing the price going up like that, I think you'd see a lot of redistribution of that money as it got pumped back into economic activity. Okay. A currency that has no economic activity isn't a currency, and so you can't just simply hold. The reason gold achieved that position was a historical anomaly, because there there wasn't a way. To have a system that was simultaneously a good store of value and a good medium of exchange and able to do global trade, because gold is too damn heavy and uncomfortable to carry in large quantities, that it just fails as a medium of exchange. Otherwise, you you know the the only reason people hoard and hold gold to the extent they do is because it's almost impossible to spend because you have to carry it. It's bloody heavy. Yeah, and you have to find somebody who will take your gold. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> and trust that it's real and all of that. One of the big advantages that Bitcoin has, of course, is that it is an incredibly flexible、uh, medium of exchange that can actually be spent and transmitted and transported at great speeds and ease. So the idea that we end up with a similarly stagnant, dead store of value of the form of gold, I think, is outlandish. Then there's the Ethical aspect of this, which is what distinguishes the people who became early adopters in this technology versus the previous global financial rich and elite.、Mm-hmm. And to me, it's the difference between people who are generationally wealthy because their great great grandfather murdered more hundreds of thousands of people than the other person's great 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 grandfather, which is the basis of most of the generational wealth in our world today. Is exploitation, imperialism, colonialism, genocides, resource extraction, human slavery, and all of those things.、Um, even the so-called free market billionaires of our age get most of their wealth、uh, because the system is rigged to allow them to avoid competition. Real free markets. Achieve equilibrium of supply and demand at a price that is barely above cost, with profits converging to zero. Adam Smith, the basics of economics: the market will radically cut profits by pulling in more and more competitors. If you're in the least bit successful in any market, until you're working on razor thin margins, that's n- free markets do not create billionaires. Free markets do not create. Massive generational wealth concentrated in a few hands, because they eradicate the opportunity to concentrate so much power, because other people compete. The only way you get to that kind of plutarchy is by monopoly, manipulation, regulation, barriers, exploitation. The beautiful thing about cryptocurrencies is that they actually create free and open markets, which means that the profit margin of people engaging in these markets should converge to zero. You should be able to make just enough to cover your costs, but not become the new wealthy elite. If we do end up with a bunch of wealthy elite, they will be the people who took enormous risk on an untested technology against the advice of every sane person around them, rather than kill the hundred thousand. Uh, natives to steal their gold, cocoa,、uh, or soybeans, right? right.、Um, a slightly more ethical basis for wealth, but I don't think it lasts at all. And one of the ways it doesn't last is probably the mechanism of boom and bust cycles that we've seen in Bitcoin. So Bitcoin gets redistributed on a regular basis because it goes through these ridiculous boom and bust cycles.、Right. Um, So the people, when they feel very rich, spend it,、uh, or when they panic, spend it, and, and that causes a lot of movement, redistributing the wealth. There does seem to be a big ethic of hodl, though, within the Bitcoin community. I,、yeah. I agree with you that people are investing, they are spending, but most of the Bitcoiners who I've personally met, and maybe that's a bias, have a huge emphasis on continuing to accumulate and holding as much as they possibly can. Yeah, because they see that vision on in the future. But、right. there's a lot of talk of hodl. <laughs> but if you talk to some of the people who have been in a long time and you have a really honest conversation,、mm-hmm. they will admit that it's actually very difficult to execute on that plan. So when a whole bunch of Bitcoiners、um, 
tell you about how much they're hodling, I give that about as much credence as a whole bunch of 13-year-old middle school boys telling you about how much sex they're having. Gotcha. It's like, yeah, they're all, they're all amazing at hodling. Uh, that's what they tell everyone around them. The reality, of course, is they're all terrified that their failure to hodl is theirs and everybody else is succeeding. Right. Um, no, people, people want to talk a big game. It's actually very difficult to hodl. Um, because you, even though everyone wants to believe in this vision of massive, massive increases in, in price, there's always that nagging fear that maybe the best days were behind. Mm-hmm. Maybe I should just take out some profits while I'm ahead of the game. Um, they wrote a really nasty article today, right? Okay. And that is, it's not as easy as it looks, right? I have failed to haul uh, repeatedly in this industry. And I treat it much more like a currency. Every month I earn, every month I spend. One of the nice things about that is it also shields you from volatility. I don't care what the price is. Because if I earn and spend in the same month, the volatility doesn't affect me anymore. Right? Mm-hmm. It, yeah. I get it one end, I lose it the other. It all washes out, averages out. I've been operating my business from when Bitcoin was less than $100 to when Bitcoin was over $20,000. And every single one of those months, I've earned a bit, I've spent a bit, I've earned a bit, I've spent a bit. Yeah. So I don't know how the future plays out to create this, you know, super financial elite who walk around in their mech suits, shooting lasers with the peasants <laughs> and, and, and crushing them under their and mech suit in, feet. And right. else. <laughs> yeah, it's very much a kind of Iron Man, Bat Cave, dystopia. Um, I hope we don't recreate a financial system that has enough barriers to allow people to do that. Yeah. Uh, one of the other things that happens, which is even better, is that a lot of the people who hodl, they fail to maintain their keys. A lot of the Bitcoin that doesn't move is locked forever and will never be released. Wow. So what that ends up doing is it recirculates that as value through deflation to the people who still have the keys for the much smaller amounts that they can still move. Do you have right. any kind of estimate on how much of Bitcoin has been locked up? Several million, at least. Several million, at least. I mean, I keep hearing stories. Several hearing million Bitcoin. Like a quarter. Several million Bitcoin. Like a quarter wow. to a half. Yeah, of all but that. probably. Wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I, I think it's more than a quarter, which means that, that that means that the actual liquid supply that exists is much less than people think, which mm-hmm. we see in market movements. And that um, it's being redistributed to newbies yeah. because the original holders died without passing on their keys, lost their keys, had computer accidents. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Boating you know, accidents. Boating accidents. <laughs> yeah, I guess on that topic of newbies, uh, we move into our second question. Um, so you've been criticized in the Bitcoin community for being a bit of like a social justice warrior of oh, Bitcoin. Dear. <laughs> We're going there. We're going there. Yeah. Okay. And so in yes. a lot of your speeches and talks, you seem focused on bringing women and minorities into the community. Yeah. Are these a priority I agree with? I, um, I object to that term. I okay. strenuously object to the term social justice warrior. Unless you spell it with an O after the A. Uh, so instead of warrior, it's more of a warrior. So I worry about social injustice, <laughs> but I don't battle anyone because I'm a pacifist. So I object to the warrior part. I don't object to the social justice part at all. I am all for social justice. That's okay. I never really understood the objection to that term, actually. I guess if you're a pacifist, but... I think the objection just... to that term is this image of uh, social justice being imposed through a centralized hierarchical system of coercion. If somebody forces you to do X, Y, and Z, which in some places they do, yes, that's abhorrent. Calling me a social justice warrior for the private choices I make in my behavior and my engagements and my interactions with others, um, I believe there's a term for that. Oh, yeah. Celebrated awesome libertarian Mm -hmm. uh, is the correct term for someone (laughs) who makes free will choices on how they engage in a free market with other people under voluntary cooperation. I mean, come on. And so, yes, I choose to interact with people in ways. The term is used by, in, in many ways, to talk about kind of nanny state imposition. In which case, of course, it doesn't apply to anything I'm doing or any of the other private parties that are doing, making their own choices. 
Yeah, I mean that's a fair that's a fair objection. I guess the, the the core of the question is how are you looking to influence the culture and composition of the Bitcoin community? I do not see any scenario in the future where Bitcoin survives, mm-hmm. uh, and certainly not one where Bitcoin flourishes if it becomes the domain of reactionary far-right politics or reactionary far-left politics or reactionary politics of any kind that attempts to create a series of purity tests or limitations and says this is our coin and um, and excludes the people who very much need it. The truth is that in the world we live in at the moment there are real practical centuries-old, institutional, uh, brutal barriers to opportunity, and these disproportionately fall on the, the poor of the world, but also minorities in a variety of different ways. And if the purpose of Bitcoin, again, is to maintain the same control structures, to not flatten the hierarchy of power, but to remain in the same hierarchy and just replace the top series of uh, faces with exactly the same faces, then Bitcoin has failed. Mm. It can succeed financially and fail in every other way. And in fact, I don't think it succeeds financially either if it fails in the other ways. I think Bitcoin succeeds by connecting the other six billion people who have been left out of the world economy to each other so that everyone can bring forth their full productive and human potential, their creativity, their passion, their interaction with the world uh, without barriers, by creating a brutally level playing field, a brutally open and free market where everyone has to compete. Mm -hmm. It's precisely because I believe in meritocracy that I laugh at fake mediocrity. Mm -hmm. Uh, And mediocrity is what we have. I interact with a hell of a lot of people who are very powerful, very successful, and very rich just because of being involved in this Bitcoin space. People come to me and they're like, hey, we want your opinion on this project, etc., etc. And I have never seen such concentrated mediocrity in my life until I started really interacting with some really powerful and rich people. Wow. (laughs) There is a centuries-long program of affirmative action that elevates mediocre, boring people to positions of incredible wealth and power. And if you truly believe in meritocracy, you want to dismantle that shit uh, as as effectively and quickly as possible because there are so many worthy, smart, creative people who never get anywhere because, you know... John Smythe the third arrived there with the full support of an entire generational institutional system of, of affirmative action to then become thoroughly mediocre and very pleased with himself. And I say that as someone who has benefited from entirely from that system, and I am in my position for exactly the same reason, right? <laughs> it's like yeah. um I was born to a middle class family with two educated, college educated professionals, both of whom received university educations for free um, in their respective uh, countries. And I grew up speaking two very, very useful languages in a country that had free travel throughout a broad continent of Europe. And I was able to parlay all of that into tremendous opportunity through very, very, very little effort and merit. If Bitcoin isn't about changing that structure and creating opportunity for all of those people who didn't have that, then what the fuck are we doing? Yeah. To me, it's pointless. We're Mm -hmm. just recreating what we had before. Right. And I'm sure this is going to offend a whole lot of people. Um, Okay. How do you think the the culture of Bitcoin would feel different if there were more women and more like uh, racial diversity? Um, I, I think it, I think it requires more than just gender and racial diversity. I think one of the biggest issues we have is language and socioeconomic status diversity. Mm-hmm. Um, so there aren't enough poor uh, Spanish speakers or 
uh, poor Swahili speakers or uh, poor Chinese Mandarin speakers in the space. And uh, a very, very big amount of the important educational material only exists in English, right? So if the, the, the prerequisite to get involved in this is uh, literacy in English, technical literacy, mm -hmm. access to computers, access to internet connections, access to all of these other things, well, I mean, it's not a surprise that you get the outcomes that you get. But how can we possibly know what the needs of the other six billion are if they're, if they're not even involved in the conversation? Right. What the hell do I know about living in Barrio 31 um, or, or life in the, in the Brazilian favelas or um, being a subsistence farmer in Kenya? And yet I know the, uh, these are the people who are cut off from the economic system of the world. Um, so unless we bring those experiences into Bitcoin so they can inform our design choices, so they can not just inform participate, create, build the very design choices and interfaces. You know, a powerful Bitcoin wallet is not a wallet that allows me to buy a cup of coffee at Starbucks. I already have magic plastic that I don't even need to touch the reader. I can just wave it <laughs> at a distance and magically transfer money with no barriers to get my coffee. We don't fucking need that. What we do need is for people who are undocumented, illiterate, um, who are operating in a system of oppression under, uh, under controls, under government corruption, etc., to have a glimmer of hope, a possibility of doing that. So what kind of wallet do they need? When I was working with um, exchanges in India, uh, for example, they were building exchange interfaces that were entirely based on voice. Voice synthesis and recognition. Why? 80% of their customer base is illiterate. The internet for them is the ability to watch a video and hear someone speak Hindi and then be able to say, I don't know what the OK Google equivalent is mm -hmm. in the Indian language, but be able to speak to the phone because you can't type, mm -hmm. right? So, how the reason we need to broaden the diversity of audience in this space is because the primary area of demand, the primary use case for this is the people who don't have access to the current system. And the reason they don't have access to the current system is not because they don't have money or because they don't have productive potential. It's all of the other barriers, which are all consequences of the lottery of birth. Um, that have nothing to do with merit, capability, or, or even productive potential, and have everything to do with being trapped in a, in, in a cycle of barriers, right? So um, I can't build that Bitcoin. None of us can. We have no fucking clue how to build that Bitcoin because we don't speak the language, we don't have the experience, we don't know what the interfaces need to be, we don't even understand the use cases. We're tr still trying to build the Bitcoin that buys you a cup of coffee at Starbucks. So... So do you think that um, by, by just projecting an image of being welcoming to women and minorities um, and yeah, sort of populations who have been disadvantaged over time, that we can bring those people into the industry and they can sort of help themselves and pull themselves up by their bootstraps? No, you know absolutely I mean? not. No, I mean, that's just step one. First of all, you have to scream loudly, welcome, come here, yes, I want to talk, please join us, whatever. Mm -hmm. Um... But that's not enough. I mean, it, it takes it takes active interference with all of the existing biases. How do you bring speakers to a conference when a lot of the independent voices in the space do not have the corporate funding to travel to a conference, right? How do you create more opportunities so that content can be delivered in multiple languages online so that someone can watch it from their home instead of having to travel because they can't travel. How do you do that if all of the conferences in the United States were, as of now, 80% of the fucking world can't even get a visa to visit a conference? Nobel Prize winners can't go to their Nobel ceremony. <laughs> you know, it, wow. so who, who's going to come to the Bitcoin conference in New York and pay your $3,000 um ticket on your business class flight, great. That's the same people you already are being served by this. So it takes more than just 
saying these things, it, it, it means taking active steps to create uh, an environment in which it is indeed possible for people to participate. Right. And um, it's happening. It's happening all around the world. People are doing things in their local communities with their local meetups. Um, they're sitting down with their neighbors. They're teaching them how to use the tools and how to open the doors to this to this space. I think actually the biggest barrier is is language, mm-hmm. and and that's why for me the, the 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 top initiative I have in my work is volunteer translations of as many of the materials as possible. Um, well, yeah, how many how many languages are your books translated into? I think I guess Mastering Bitcoin is your your most most well known book. So the the, the books are. The, between 12 and 17 languages, I think, is the most. The videos have been done in 33 languages. Wow. Uh-huh. And, and they're growing every day. I mean, as of now, I've had more than 8,000 volunteers translating my work. And it's a huge blessing. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, I wanted to ask one more question. Yeah. Um, it has to do with Bitcoin culture. Um, so Bitcoin as uh, a decentralized currency... Um, takes away one of the one of the most important powers of the nation state, which is the power to create and control money. Yeah. And so for this reason, there's a there's a large overlap between Bitcoiners, anarchists, and libertarians. Can I just uh, interject there? <laughs> Can instead of take away, say take back? Take back control. Of it. Yes. Yeah. Sure. The, the ability to create and control money. Currency is a societal structure that predates governments. Right. Um, Massively predates government. And therefore, we have had currency much longer than we've had government. Government has usurped the power from society to create currency and have introduced enough monopolistic barriers to ensure that it can't be taken back. And now it can be taken back. Right. So that's, that's a so let's take that's it back. A, so sure. I, I agree. And that's, that's a very libertarian stance. And so I think, um, so, so what Bitcoin should lead to is, uh, or, or probably, or, what it seems like the culture of Bitcoin is wishing for is more decentralized governance. Is it a libertarian stance? I could equally argue that it's a Marxist stance. People seizing the power of production <laughs> over money. I mean, <laughs> why? It, it's not political. It's, it's not political. It's not left versus right. It's centralized versus decentralized. Okay, well, so how- Centralized fascism on the right versus centralized fascism on the left. Are both centralized. That is their defining characteristic. The whether they couch their propaganda in in collectivism or or personality cults doesn't fucking change anything. The bottom line is what they do is they centralize power. We're talking about re decentralizing the power, and that is not a political position that belongs to the okay, left or the right. I, I'm only saying that because people think that Bitcoin is a libertarian system. Okay, well let's let's say let's say um, Bitcoin is a decentralist technology. Yes, and it's working towards the decentralization of political power. Yes. Do you think so? Do you think that that's the case? And do you think and what do you think such a world would look like? I think with, such with, a world would look like exactly how the world looked like thousands of years ago, when money first emerged as a completely decentralized, completely localized system that had severe limitations in its reach and scale, but otherwise was perfectly decentralized. For thousands of years, we have had money that is peer-to-peer, instantly recognizable, verifiable, untraceable, completely anonymous, bearer instruments. Hmm. We've had money like that for thousands of years. The world did not end. Um, Sometime in the 70s, we decided the only way you could do money was to massively centralize it under a system of surveillance and control, and otherwise the world would descend into chaos because bad people would use money. That is a historical aberration. Interesting. So that almost sounds a little bit, um, a little bit reactionary. Like, like we want to return to this this point in the past where we had this sort of uh, this glorious um, decentralized monetary technology, and now we have this aberration, which is fiat money. Um, would you say that, or is it is it is Bitcoin is is Bitcoin reactionary or is it futuristic? I think it's entirely futuristic because we're not returning to that past. In fact, we're massively improving over it um, by, for the first time, creating the most abstract, intangible, mobile, flexible, um, and fluid system of payments and currency uh, that has the potentially the greatest degree of decentralization we've ever seen. 
And uh, more importantly, it is unstoppable because it has no physical form. And it is much, much harder to disrupt, co-opt, or control. So it's futuristic as hell. It's a techno-utopian vision, but it doesn't have to be utopian. And we're not positioning Bitcoin as the destroyer of fiat. Fiat is the destroyer of fiat. (laughs) The traditional money system we have is bloated, corrupt, fragile, and teetering because of all of its weaknesses. Mm. It attracts parasites, it centralizes power and control, it dilutes, erodes, and destroys democracy and democratic control over the system of money. Uh, It encourages the worst kind of parasitic behavior. And as a result, it is destroying itself. The world's central bankers have a much bigger problem than Bitcoin. And that is that they can no longer pretend to keep up this uh, illusion of control over the world's economy, right? It's spinning out of control. And it's almost like a patient whose only chance of uh, having their heart still beating is to continuously pump, um, you know, adrenaline into their blood, right? And, and now it's not even a matter of do we keep pumping adrenaline, but we have to keep keeping the dose up. Interesting. Um, and they're like, look, the patient is very much alive. Their heart rate is well over 350 <laughs> beats per minute. <laughs> I think they're improving. In fact, we've been able to get their heart beating even faster. It's like, n- n- no. <laughs> <laughs> they're so healthy. <laughs> it's like, Strong like an ox. <laughs> it's like when you've been awake for 36 hours and you're like, maybe more coffee will help. <laughs> <laughs> no. Interesting. So it seems like um, so the, the sort of maybe Western society it has... Um, has gone beyond pathological by maybe by creating this fiat Not just Western system. society, the entire system of centralized finance mm-hmm. has become increasingly fragile and corrupt because of centralization. Bitcoin is not the destroyer of fiat. It is the, uh, the opportunity to demonstrate through juxtaposition an alternative view of what the future can be and invite people to voluntarily choose to participate in that, not to the exclusion of fiat, but hopefully in a way that diversifies their risk so that it can be perhaps a bit of a lifeboat. And the biggest worry I have about Bitcoin is that the lifeboat isn't big enough and the friggin' Titanic is sinking faster than anyone expected. And everybody's pointing at the lifeboat going, stop doing that. It's making us sink faster. You're telling people to get onto the boats. Everybody stay on the ship. Everything is fine. (laughs) And and that is the really dangerous attitude in today's world, right? When, when, When the building is on fire, you don't stop the people who are pointing towards the exits. And, and that's what Bitcoin is. It's a giant sign that says, Safety this way. The door is pretty small. We're going to have to squeeze you in. Please don't all come at the same time. But it's still better than what's happening in that fucking building. And anybody who's telling you, please ignore the fire alarm. Everything's fine. Interesting. Is is the dangerous, is the dangerous, radical person in the room. The most radical experiment in money that has ever happened is the introduction of negative and zero interest rates and unlimited stimulus for the first time across more than 30 central banks all across the world simultaneously in the largest, most radical monetary experiment that has ever happened, and it is failing. That's right. I have, to, I, have to, I have to pay the bank uh, in order to hold my money for me, right? Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's never happened before. When I studied economics in college, uh, you know, as a minor, not as a not as my main area of study. I'm not an economist by any means, but I remember reading in the book and it said interest rates can never be negative because that would be a disaster for the economy. I'm like, oh, well, I guess that's out of the window. <laughs> oh, no, now it's fine. It's fine. Yeah. Look, 350 beats per minute. This patient is bouncing back. <laughs> oh, awesome. I guess to end on a positive note, um, one thing we were kind of talking about earlier is if you could identify any science fiction book or universe as being the most likely to result from a uh, this Bitcoin experiment that's taking place, which one would you? Yeah, is it Blade Runner or Terminator or, or Star Trek or which which sci-fi would, would, is the is the most likely? Give me Bitcoin. 
One of my um, favorite online memes is the idea of the boring dystopia. <laughs> the idea that we were promised flying cars, and what we got instead is Instagram feeds. <laughs> um, and influencers. And we are truly living in a boring dystopia. It is crushingly bad in its outcomes, but without any of the uh, high-tech, futuristic goodies that we all expected, right? We're not making colonies of Mar on Mars, but we are building concentration camps on the Arizona border. Like, <laughs> how the hell did we get to that one? Um, science fiction. Cory Doctor is one of my favorite uh, futurist authors of the time. Um, he despises Bitcoin, um, <laughs> which hurts a bit. But he still writes uh, poignant and incredibly insightful books, and read them all. Cool. Okay. <laughs> all right. Best I can do. Well, okay. Cool. Thank you well, so much. Thanks so much for coming on. Yeah. Uh, I wish we had more time to discuss uh, all the various implications of Bitcoin. Uh, but next think, time, I think this. I think next our time. audience will, uh, will, will get thank a lot of this. So yeah. so. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you guys for tuning in. We will see you soon. Bye guys. <laughs> Bitcoin, Bitcoin, Bitcoin. Okay. Thanks for joining us on the Multiversity Project. We hope you found this episode both mind bending and enjoyable. We can be found all over the social media space and at multiversityproject.co. If you like this content, give us a like, comment, follow, share, or support us on Patreon. Catch you on the flip side.